uh, I don't know if I'm on now, am I? Yes, you are online. Yes. And um, okay. before one moment before the speaker start, uh, we want to record at least your keynotes, if it's okay for you. Of course. Uh, okay. Can I ask? Uh, uh, I'm still a bit in doubt about how long I actually have to talk. 20, if you maximum 20 minutes. Obviously, if you are going to be a little bit shorter or whatever, that's it's fine. not a problem. That's fine. So thank I you. have a, uh, no, thank you. I have a PowerPoint I'd like to share. Is that okay? Yeah. Right. Uh, let's see. Right. Here we go. So um, my, uh, I'm sorry, I just came from another uh, lecture, so uh, uh, so I'm all uh, I'm all lectured out really, really. But uh, I've been looking forward to uh, seeing you all, and I've been looking forward to this event as well. And I'd first of all like to thank you all for for arranging this uh, and for putting together the network. I think it's important and it's much appreciated. I've been working the last couple of years in with um, uh, transnational organized crime. Uh, is the uh, official term. Uh, it's uh, it's it's very much transnational. It's it's often not as organised as trans as as the organised and transnational organised crime makes it seem. Uh, and so I've been doing so from from Guinea Bissau, from with a point of departure in Guinea Bissau, uh, and I'm right now working on a book called The Margin in the Middle. Uh, and I think it, to a certain extent, this sums up my work quite well in this regard. Uh, the margin in the middle is, a, is of course, another way of uh, 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 accentuating the trickster-like character of some of these uh, uh, criminal uh, flows or criminalized flows and formations. Um, and I think it will be clear, uh, uh, hopefully be clear, why the margin in the middle makes sense for me as, a, as an analytical in terms of, of my work on, on ethnographic or anthropological criminology. I work traditionally with um, guys like this. This is where I started my, ethno from where I started my ethnography. It's a militia soldier, soldier in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, and he's part of a, a militia called the Guentas that I've been following for, for many years now. Uh, the, these kinds of militant formations are criminologically interesting in, its own, in their own right because they are, as you might uh, be able to tell from the picture, unlawfully mobilized combatants. Uh, so they are, they're mobilized outside the rules of law, which actually is an interesting criminological uh, research field in, it, in, in itself. As you can see from the picture, uh, the genes and the uh, not full uniform character of his presence sort of direct our attention to this. As you can also see, um, uh, even though he looks like a militiaman from the Upper Guinea coast, as they probably are most, uh, he's trying to fight a war in flip-flops. Uh, when you're trying to fight a war in flip-flops, it's, uh, it's not expedient footwear. It's difficult to fight a war in flip-flops. You wouldn't want to. In Guinea-Bissau, a, a poor man is called a pizzinello, a flip-flop foot. So it actually also indicates his, his sort of social position, you might say. Uh, so I work with young, primarily young men. They're not that young anymore. Uh, they're impoverished and they're urban. Uh, and I do so, uh, as said, the point of departure is here in the Upper Guinea coast uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Guinea-Bissau is not a place we uh, uh, normally uh, uh, pay a great deal of uh, attention to. It used to be Portuguese Guinea and was uh, colonized uh, uh, via the establishment of a range of uh, uh, slave forts and trading posts along the Upper Guinea coast. Uh, and it, it uh, as the slave trade disintegrated uh, uh, with abolition, so uh, so did the importance of Guinea-Bissau for the Portuguese colonial empire, and it very quickly became a colonial outback. Uh, it was uh, probably the least valued, at least in terms of investments, uh, one of the least valued areas of the Portuguese colonial area uh, era of, uh, era, and then um, became a, a quite impoverished place uh, uh, left. Uh, to a great deal of extent, to a great extent, to fend for itself. Um, it was also the uh, 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 the locus of a long fought civil uh, war, a liberation war from 1996 to 1973. 
which became a Cold War per proxy. So uh, uh, they, uh, Portugal was with NATO uh, forces fighting uh, the PAIGC, the liberation movement, with Cuba, Cuban and Warsaw Pact, Pact forces in the country. Um, Guinea-Bissau gained its independence in 73. And after that, it became uh, an area of, uh, we can say, post-colonial decline. Uh, it, uh, uh, though it gained it, its liberation, it, it didn't turn into to what was expected by the PAIGC, uh, but rather turned into a space full of factional conflict, of autocracy, repression, uh, and, and strife. And this strife in 1998 turned into full-scale civil war, which brings us back to the Guintas, where I started. Uh, so this was when the, the people I worked with and still work with um, were mobilized uh, as the private militia for the country's uh, uh, president at the time. Uh, the impact of the civil war was quite uh, brutal. Uh, so the aftermath of it uh, was one of, of a massive uh, donor flight. It was one of relative endemic conflict and, and uh, uh, heightened insecurity. I've been trying to write about this elsewhere and trying to say, uh, saying that, well, some of these countries, we might have to look at them not as places of crisis, uh, but uh, uh, of, of a, a space where, where the social political turmoil becomes so long run that it becomes a space of chronicity. Uh, so people don't live through crisis, they have to make their lives in crisis. They don't wait for it to go over or take shelter, they actually have to, to uh, build an everyday within something that's quite uh, tumultuous and, and quite conflictual. And in Bissau's situation, hyper-impoverished, uh, in terms of food insecurity, 87% of the population now report to commonly going hungry. So it's, it's, uh, it's a lovely place. It has lots of good things going forward, but it's also, and it's getting better, but it's also a space that has been defined by quite enduring hardship. Uh, my fieldwork in Bissau uh, became with the Gwentas after they were demobilized, um, it became a place of, of waiting and of uh, a place of, of hanging out with people that didn't have anything to do and who were longing for some sort of impetus, some sort of energy in their life and in society. Um, so they literally talk about uh, Guinea-Bissau as a prison without walls. No está atrapado ali, they say we're stuck here. Uh, uh, or uh, 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 another interlocutor told me uh, that now Bissau catafasi part of the mundo part. Bissau isn't even a part of the world anymore. Testifying to this uh, quite palpable sense of abandonment. Um, so. Uh, uh, there's a feeling of being socially and geopolitically abject in Bissau, not just of being impoverished, but, but literally of being cut off and thrown away, of, of being an unimportant node in the geopolitical uh, uh, sort of world picture. And, and hence uh, also of, uh, uh, of salvage or, or of uh, things getting better, being something that's quite difficult to see when that will, will actually materialize. Um, so there's a, it, it's, I've been trying to, to um, uh, define it as a sort of social moratorium, that they're stuck in this, in this uh, waiting position without actually, uh, without it being clear how to go about it and what to do. Uh, the sense of abandonment uh, and this sense of stuckness or, 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 or social death, I've been trying to art define it as well, was really super palpable until around 2005. Uh, and I would go back and forth uh, more or less every year and the Aguintas would be in the same situation or, or in one that was getting worse. Uh, I mean, literally becoming thinner and thinner and more and more macerated. And that's until 2005, something interesting happened. So in 2005, um, uh, batches of cocaine started being caught in Guinea, Guinean waters. Uh, this is uh, one of the bigger holes, a couple of tons impounded by the Guinean uh, Navy. Uh, it was caught in the um, uh, Bishagos Islands, a uh, uh, peninsula outside or an archipelago outside of uh, uh, Bissau proper. 
uh, and was as said impounded by the Navy. After it was impounded by the Navy, it was given to the army to look after and uh, finally burn. And in that process, it got lost. Uh, and no one really knows how it got lost or where it was lost to or where it went. We just know that these couple of tons of cocaine landed uh, uh, and then disappeared. And that process happened a few times. Now, the interesting thing here was that a criminalized development like that, a massive influx of cocaine, it was rapid, it made a dent. All of a sudden, uh, uh, from being uh, an outback that no one cared about, even if uh, war did break out, it would make a, a one line in the most unimportant uh, part of a, a, a international news. Um, Bissau became a place that people actually started talking about. Uh, so it went from being geopolitically insignificant to gaining an alter importance. It also went from a place with next to no news from 2000 to 2005 to uh, uh, no less than 233 international reports within the next uh, five years. And these reports were focused on, on uh, Bissau as the cocaine coast, as a cocaine country. And my favorite, because it's a paraphrase of Karen Blixen, a Danish author, out of Africa, the new coast. Cocaine mules. Um, so it, it, it uh, changed uh, uh, the sort of international standing uh, uh, of, of Guinea Bissau completely. And uh, not that it became better, it just became uh, something that there was awareness of. Um, the international organizations were also up in arms saying this is Africa's first narco state. Uh, two thirds of the cocaine consumed in Europe is said to travel through the upper Guinea coast. And that's a massive increase in cocaine consumption in Europe. It has been a, a really quite drastic increase. Uh, and obviously the revenue from the cocaine trade currently dwarfs Guinea Bissau's GNP and has done for the last 15 years running. So instead of being an outback, uh, an abject, uh, 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 an abandoned space, uh, Bissau became an important node in a $2 billion uh, trade. It went from being a transshipment point to a drug hub in its own right, not just a point of connection, but a space of commerce. Uh, and if we think about it historically, we're looking at, at old uh, routes, but new goods. The, the, the cocaine is shipped over from South America, actually mainly from Brazil into Guinea-Bissau and then upwards into uh, Europe uh, in a shotgun approach. The place became politically expedient. Um, uh, one commentator said that for, for the cartels, moving into Bizarre was like moving in to an empty house. It was a state that, that granted them the protection of a vacant sovereignty, you may say. Uh, we also saw a process that resembles, if not uh, aligns to a, a movement from weak states to failed states and state capture, and helped, uh, hence had a lot of, of uh, political commentators up in arms in that respect. Uh, but what's clear is that it was a move into a state which only had nominal existence. Uh, I mean, it doesn't exist as an entity that protects its citizens. And it, it, it surely doesn't exist as something that has a, a consolidated uh, unitary uh, legitimate control of violence. Uh, not a hierarchical, but a heterarchical order, we may say, uh, and negotiable and adaptable uh, political structure uh, for elite protection. Bissau was also geographically convenient. It's this highway 10, the 10th latitude as it's called. So you can move from Brazil with uh, speedboats, small seater Cessna airplanes, long uncontrolled post coastline uh, and an international shipping route that runs right past it. And then we can say in terms of the shotgun approach of moving the drugs further up north, Bissau is interestingly historically connected. It adds into this uh, Saharan trade route uh, via Mali, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and Libya. The coastal trade route via Senegal, Mauritania, Morocco, and Cap Verde as well, and allows for this shotgun approach, diversifying traffic, minimizing loss. And finally, uh, this is where it ties into my concrete ethnography. Bissau was socially uh, opportune. So the political ethnography I've been do doing in Bissau is focused on personalized state institutions, on, on exactly on this heterarchic order, order a flexible political uh, network, uh, and a large disenfranchised or, or impoverished population group. So there was a repurposing of existing flows and networks, but also uh, a putting 
uh, uh, precarity to use within a criminalized enterprise be quite, became quite clear. Now, interestingly, when I do my fieldwork with you people who used to uh, be uh, Gwentas, uh, they very quickly became in, uh, ingrained and, and included into the cocaine trade because the cocaine trade is said to generate income and livelihoods, yeah. Um, so they talk about it actually as, as a trampoline de vida, life trampoline. And here's a, a discussion with uh, Maduro who later moved to uh, Portugal and was uh, imprisoned as a as a drug uh, uh, mule and is now back in Bissau uh, uh, deported. He said it's the biggest trampoline there is. Uh, trampolina If you know someone who trusts you, you can see a ticket and all. He says. So so he was trying to explain to me that actually connecting to this was a way out of this social moratorium. It was a way out of this space of abandonment. Or another person says you do what's needed. If you can go as a mule, it's called an ngulidur. If you can go as a mule, you go clearly ask anyone who will not do it. If someone offers you who will refuse, if there's a possibility, you go, you must go. So if we look at this, what the ethnography clarifies is, first of all, obviously there are two flows uh, uh, of cocaine running through uh, Bissau. One is a primary flow of cocaine. Uh, Bissau is a drug hub, a place of stories, storage and distribution for the cartels. And this is moved up by a fishing boat from Mauritania, via cargo ships, high seas, uh, big, big amounts of lumber and so on. And then by uh, containers to Tangiers, which is one of the last places we've been doing fieldwork, trying to figure out how it, how it, it siphons through the container harbor, Tangier mid. And then there's a secondary movement, which is really what my ethnography centers on, which is what you in criminological terms call the ant, call the ant trail. So this, this endless movement of, of, uh, of minor quantities uh, stored in bags, in, in goods, minor goods, uh, and, and often from the Guinean coast uh, in people's uh, bellies as they traffic, as they move over uh, borders and boundaries. So uh, the ant trail looks at traffickers uh, yeah, and it looks at mules and does the ethnography with that. And very much is what I do with the cross graphically. I, I, um, I do a, a transnational ethnography, ethnography where I follow people uh, from one uh, space, Guinea-Bissau and upwards, you may say. The last bit of fieldwork I've been doing has been in uh, Lisbon, uh, once again, uh, with uh, mules and dealers of cocaine. Uh, people gravitate towards uh, Lisbon, uh, both because uh, it's, it used to be uh, the main seat of the colonial empire, uh, and and uh, uh, because of the Portuguese language connection, because of that, but also because of social networks, uh, and because Lisbon ties into the Atlantic as such in a quite fantastic way, uh, so uh, it feels very central in terms of, and is very central in terms of Brazil, in terms of Cape Verde, and in terms of Guinea, which all intersect in this movement up. Um, so it was. Uh, very ethnographic, uh, uh, very descriptive, perhaps. But I think uh, if I uh, am I uh, uh, running short of time now, or uh, you still have uh, exactly two minutes left. <laughs> so exactly two minutes left. Okay. Right. Um, so what we can see from taking this approach in terms of the margin in the middle is that it becomes clear when doing it, the ethnography and when looking at this from an anthropological, criminological perspective that there are areas of the world that are so marginal that they become central for something else. And in this situation, we may say that is, is what has characterized Bissau, uh, uh, gaining a centrality in terms of illicit and illegal movement. Um, it's also clear that it's exactly the combination or the intersection of geopolitical insignificance, global indifference and recognized sovereignty, which does something uh, uh, really quite interesting. It's an interesting nexus in a, in a criminological perspective. So um, uh, Guinea-Bissau's problems, uh, we may say, link up expediently in the shadow side of, of globality. 
uh, and and doing the ethnography might actually allow us uh, allow us to see how this is done, but also to look at the underlying and clarify the underlying pos uh, the aspects of of impoverty and abandonment that that uh, 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 make this possible as a materialization. Um, so uh, the point here is is uh, not as much to point my fingers at Bissau or, or illuminate Bissau as something that's a, a core agent in something that's criminalized. I mean, the drugs are produced elsewhere. Uh, they are snorted in Europe. Uh, Bissau provides the, the uh, precarious mules that actually traffic things from one place to another. Um, so it's, it's trying to show the structural and underlying issues at stake here um, uh, in terms of, of uh, of um, uh, showing how abandonment and showing how disregard for other areas, poverty actually can become politically, uh, a kind of political aporia, uh, a solution to a problem that makes everything worse. That's, Thank you uh, so much. <laughs> perfect, <laughs> exactly perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Henrik, for this uh, really fascinating and intense presentation. Um, and thank you also for giving us a glimpse behind the scenes of an ethnography of harmful hardships in Guinea-Bissau and also uh, yeah, unlawful cross-border mobilities. I'm sure this will um, elicit quite some discussions later on. So we will now um, move on to our next speaker, Lucia Micheduti. Lucia is the Professor of Anthropology and Head of the Social Anthropology Section at the University College London. Um, she is PI of the ERC project, Anthropologies of Extortion, and her main fields uh, of interest lie in the intersection between political and legal anthropology, as well as the anthropology of religion. Um, and she's currently the convener of the research program Democratic Culture and of the new master's political, uh, po Politics, Violence and Crime. She has been very influential in the ethnographic study of popular democracy, violence, crime and politics, as well as cultures of leadership, authority and masculinity. She has carried out extensive fieldwork in North India and has worked in Venezuela, as well as on South Asia and comparative contexts. In her recent publication, Mafia Raj, The Rule of Bosses in South Asia in 2018, she focused on mafia systems of governance. Lucia, I give you the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank you, thank um, David, uh, Martin and uh, Lene for inviting me here. And uh, I was really, really happy when I saw the NECTOR announced a couple of months ago. Very excited that uh, someone had the energy to do that. And even more excited to know that there were so many people interested actually in studying crime or thinking of studying crime anthropologically and uh, to kind of ex exchange a theoretical analytical um, kind of uh, ideas with uh, other subjects such criminologists or um, sociologist of, uh, of crime. And uh, so thank you very much for uh, organize, for doing this. And uh, uh, I just want, um, I said, I started to be interested in anthropology of crime, I think probably 10 years ago when, uh, I, I, when I was doing research, a big ERC research project, comparative project on uh, muscular politics in South Asia. And uh, that was a study of uh, uh, so-called kind of uh, uh, strong men or gangster politicians uh, across India, Pakistan and uh, uh, Bangladesh, which kind of took me to kind of start to be interested in, in, in crime, as I will explain soon. And uh, then on, on the return from the field, I decided to develop a course, a module on anthropology of crime, which has been very successful. And through, the, and through teaching anthropology, anthropology of crime or trying to teach anthropology of crime as there is not much literature directly which focus on that. And uh, I kind of started to kind of be getting more into it. And I, I think the exchange with students has been great in this uh, regard as well. And uh, uh, finally, a few months back, I started a, a new project which is uh, entitled uh, Anthropology of Extortion. And uh, it just, I just started a couple of uh, months ago and it's funded by the ERC as well. And uh, um, so today I think I'm going to talk about uh, extortion. And uh, 
and I try to explain why I got so much interested in exploring the social life of extortion in a comparative anthropological fashion. And uh, by, by so doing, I hope to highlight uh, why uh, I think it is useful to engage in crime anthropologically and also in engage in theoretically in, uh, in exchanges with criminology, and in particular, in my case, with scholars of, uh, of mafia. So for me, I mean, as I say, it all started in to, around 2012 when I began to do research on so-called criminal politicians in North India. This is my field site where I've been doing the research for the past 20 years now. And uh, uh, so to give a bit of background at the time, uh, 30, uh, when I started in, in the project in 2012, 34% of the member of parliament were at criminal histories. I think it went up since then, now it's about 40%. So it's a kind of trend that is going, is going up rather than down. And uh, uh, public concern with the criminalization of politics and the politicization of, uh, of criminals in the region indeed transcends anxieties about endemic uh, um, nepotism, or for example, mismanagement of, of public funds. And indeed, many criminal politicians are not just accused of embezzlement or of kind of corruption, but of burglary, kidnapping, rape, murder, murder, and as I was, I will say, extortion. And indeed, so that the kind of the the, pol the observed political and economic uh, uh, landscape. Uh, uh, emerge not only as corrupt, but indeed as a kind of very highly violent uh, um, spheres. And we ask uh, in the research, we're asking why people voted for criminal politicians and trying to understand, I mean, what of this kind of muscular style of uh, politics, uh, of doing politics, so why it was legitimated at the local level, in which ways, and indeed to try to understand what type of violence were considered licit, illicit. Uh, criminal or not criminal and map out that in the field. I mean, the result of data has been kind of two books. One is Mafia Raj, the rule of bosses in South Asia. And the other is another added volume on uh, the wide East, criminal political economies in, in South Asia. So when I started to explore uh, this the phenomenon of the criminalization of politics, usually available studies, there were quite few at the time. There were quite a lot of media reports but they tended to focus mainly on uh, the statistics, the numbers of uh, the allegedly criminal politicians and the, their, their numbers in the different kind of assemblies, elected assemblies, state or national. But they didn't really kind of uh, stop and try to analyze the crimes that uh, these uh, um, people are, were accused of and uh, the type of crimes that these people were accused of. And uh, so in, in short, they didn't pay much attention about uh, the, uh, the, the, the criminal, uh, criminal CVs. And uh, so I started to kind of look at it and I, I was kind of shadowing a couple of, uh, um, of these strong men and strong women as well. And uh, I almost immediately realized that of course not all crimes were conducive to make a kind of successful political and economic career. Indeed, I think not all crimes are, are, are conducive to rule and to produce sovereignty, which is quite something that they need to do uh, in order in, to get, in order to get um, positions of, of power. And uh, uh, importantly as well, and uh, not all of, of forms of, uh, of crime or of violence that could be kind of also be portrayed as legitimate and that will not be portrayed as bad, but actually as morally valued. And so they, they could also be boosted during uh, election campaign as part of effective and indeed make kind of decisive type of, of leaderships. So uh, the, soon I realized that one of the things that was coming up again and again was that uh, especially at the beginning of their careers, these bosses uh, were engaged in protection rackets. And then these protection rackets seem to have, so seems to be the crime that had this kind of uh, statecraft and sovereignty quality. And uh, was at the heart of, the, of uh, many of the successful kind of uh, gangster politician careers. 
And I started to be very intrigued by that and try to understand why was it so and try to understand extortion uh, through kind of not legalistic kind of, of uh, definition, but more kind of the, the try to understand socially how it was kind of uh, uh, viewed and perceived and the different manifestation as well, not in different realms of, of life. And uh, indeed, uh, protection is a, quite an ambiguous commodity, as Charles Tilly has famously commented upon. And, uh, and this is because uh, the, is, the extortionists are typically the source of violence, as well the providers of protection from the violence that they meet out. And I think this is quite this kind of ambiguity this kind of ambivalence is crucial. And there is a very fine line between being perceived as a protector and being a, pro and a provider and being perceived as a racketeer. And to, I mean, I'm not gonna go too much into the detail with that, but in North India and in my site, I found that extortion was also often dressed up in the language of virtuous protection. And uh, in the area, the, uh, one of the two uh, long valued kind of uh, potency of the ideal leader and also the ideal kind of, and also of the former Hindu king was to protect and to provide. And uh, uh, so I started to look not only at the collection of so-called wound attacks or the kind of so-called the, the, the criminal tax, the way in which kind of uh, protection rackets were collecting money from uh, businessmen or for kind of uh, or, uh, local hotels or uh, industries, but also looked at more a kind of a local theologies of uh, uh, protections, uh, how they related to caste sovereignties, how this idea of protecting your own victim was used also as a way of uh, uh, governance in the local affairs. And uh, uh, I also try to understand who locally was traditionally in, entitled to a stort and who are not, in particular in the context of, uh, of caste uh, hierarchical relations and a, re a relation of power between different communities like Hindu and Muslim communities. And, uh, and of course, this led me to, the, to, this, to look at this, this uh, kind of uh, logics as well in the realm of the family, uh, exploring question of honor of controlling of, uh, of gender and sex control, controlling of the family and the women. So, uh, however, I mean, I, when I started to look at extortion uh, anthropolo and I look at the literature on the, on the anthropological, anthropology side, there was not very much. And uh, there is quite a strong literature in, in, uh, in um, especially in South Asia on clientelism and patronage. And uh, there's been quite a lot of attention on gifts, on the uh, display of largeness, on devotion, and, uh, but not so much on the side of protection, and especially on the type of intimidation, coercion, violence, and also consent that uh, such types of protection extortion needs. And uh, by contrast, uh, immediately I can turn to look at the, the literature on, 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 crim on criminology, and uh, of course, one, the literature on mafia is the, uh, is the field where extortion has been uh, mostly kind of studied and discussed. Uh, and indeed the kind of so-called offer that one can refuse to kind of quote one of the famous sentence from the Godfather has, uh, become, uh, become quite to, has come to occupy a crucial position in the global imaginary of mafia type, uh, type of criminal organization. And uh, uh, I should say that at the same time also when I was doing this study in North, in uh, cross South Asia, the word mafia and the vernacular use of the term mafia locally uh, was uh, uh, something that started to intrigue us as a team and uh, to try to understand why these people were using this, uh, uh, this, this word, I mean, kind of, and what did, they, that did it mean? to talk about the kind of mafia or mafia Raj or mafia Indian style or Pakistani style or Bangladeshi style. And uh, uh, so, I mean, I started to kind of uh, look at the literature on uh, uh, mafia, especially Italian mafia, Russian mafia. And uh, uh, in the, of course, for extortion and protection, I mean, is uh, one of the features of the form of organized, of organized crime called mafia. 
and uh, uh, mafia as an industry of protection, so kind of as kind of famously kind of uh, theorized by Gambetta is one example, and the so-called protection theory has influenced quite a lot. Uh, the um, literature on uh, mafia and the economic view of mafia in, uh, in the, for the past uh, two decades, I think. And uh, uh, the crucial thing is that pain uh, kind of, uh, um, this literature show that shows that pain protection money can be also be beneficial for the victim. And uh, indeed, I mean, if you, this is quite important because in extortions, uh, typically two parts strike a bargain where the extorted consents, even if unwillingly, of course, to cooperate. And I think it's with such consent that set extorts rackets apart from other predatory uh, type of violent crimes. But also sets apart about other crimes because uh, the ambiguity that hangs between uh, um, over the extortion protect protection encounters can produce a variety of form of uh, uh, sociality, webs of reciprocity, mutual obligation, physical connections, friendships, complicities, and also a lot of opportunistic partnerships. And uh, these entanglements uh, can shape entire villages, neighborhoods, cities, uh, at, I think at the most intimate scale. And uh, I, something that caught my attention, one of the anth few anthropologists that work, uh, uh, produce work directly on extortion is Anthony Fontes, and in one of his articles, uh, uh, writes that uh, uh, when it comes to extortion, he says, it is difficult to, to uh, find anyone whose hands are clean. And uh, indeed, also in the, in the literature on extortion by, in the, in the mafia literature, extortion is really described as a very socially embedded crime. If it's not embedded, it doesn't work. But uh, nevertheless, much of the academic policy and media attention still remains very focused on extortion uh, economic transnational nature, rather from the focusing on the lasting effects that this type of, of uh, relation produce uh, and the kind of local social systems of governance that they produce. So uh, I thought that it would be great to study extortion social life beyond legalistic definitions. And uh, I think this is a really kind of uh, ideal object of inquiry for anthropology. And if you think up about the anthropological perspective, perspective with this focus on the conceptions and practices of relatedness, personhood, exchange, uh, offer really a great point of departure uh, for understanding the, the, the social life of extortion and its variations within and beyond the traditional organized criminal networks. So uh, in the project that is, uh, I mean, just started, we are interested in exploring and map entanglements of offers that cannot be refused in different spheres of life, in the economy, in kingship and religious uh, uh, worlds, and of course, uh, looking at, at practices of statecraft and, uh, and the way in which as well, uh, uh, at the le legal level, the courts deal with extortion. And uh, uh, so indeed, I mean, it's what we, I think I advocate is an holistic ethnography of extortion and uh, studying extortion relational power across intimate domains of the family, uh, the household, to the, the political economy of it, and. Uh, finally two areas of public authority. So I have a kind of all around kind of a traditional ethnography of the try to explain the different logics of offers that cannot be, uh, uh, can't be. Um, and uh, uh, one realm I think that is currently I'm quite interested in is the realm of the family and kinship. And uh, it should be noted that uh, in uh, um, that the language of kingship and parenthood is widely used both in politics and uh, in crime. For example, kingship terms in, uh, in India, like bahi or dada, brother, in, or uh, uh, padrino, I mean, called father in Italy, are still used to, are, are used to refer also to local violent protectors. Uh, but uh, there are very, um, usually scholars of rackets and gang violence really, really enter into the conversation with research of family and gender violence, which I think is quite uh, of, uh, 
of a pity, or as well of, with uh, um, scholars and, and kind of literature that speaks to political violence and, and communal religious violence. So in the, this uh, project, what we're really interested in is to kind of map in the mutual influences between different forms of uh, intimidation and force, and uh, to kind of try to figure out the ways such connection helps and consent. And uh, uh, I think that what, uh, um, what really, I mean, I see as this kind of anthropology of crime is doing is a very much kind of political anthropology at Winnipeg Fest. Because I think in developing a cross-cultural understanding of extortion is, uh, um, and uh, one, I mean, will help, is helping me, I mean, to engage with a question that has been at the heart of uh, my research for a long time as a political anthropologist. And which are, for example, uh, why do people obey? How is authority produced? How is politics beyond, uh, uh, works beyond and within the state? And uh, uh, so in a way I see it as a kind of uh, very much tied up to questions uh, the, uh, of, of power. And uh, what we really, I really hope uh, and this project, I must say, I kind of move on from South Asia. My other field site is Venezuela, which where I started to work like um, 10 years ago. But in this project, we have 22 sites that goes across South Asia, Latin America, Europe, and uh, East Asia, and, uh, and Africa. So we are really kind of trying to kind of have a through, through kind of comp cross-cultural comparison of uh, extortive practices and uh, focusing all, not only on kind of on the, both on South, North countries, and not only on uh, kind of uh, um, so-called developing countries or weak state. And I've, we thought that by the, doing this comparison, we might be able to also kind of give some, provide some um, nuance to kind of uh, slippery analytically, uh, analytically uh, concepts like, for example, organized, organized crime. And uh, I finished here. I don't know if I went out of time. No, perfect. I was about to, to ask you to um, yeah, good. slowly wrap it up. That's suddenly, perfect. You're all in time. That's great. I couldn't, see, I couldn't see the time suddenly because everything disappeared from my screen. So I was a bit uh, good. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Lucia, for uh, sharing with us your really fascinating and compelling work um, and also for showing and underlining really uh, how ethnographically entering the more politically powerful spheres of society um, through the field of crime and harmful behavior can help to create a more holistic approach uh, to micro level and daily dynamics. And I'm really looking forward to um, delving further into, uh, into the points raised during the, during the Q&A. So finally, I would also like to uh, welcome our uh, last speaker, A.B. Brisman. Um, A.B. is an associate professor in the School of Justice uh, Studies at Eastern Kentucky University in the US, an adjunct associate professor in the School of Justice at Queensland University of Technology in Australia, as well as conjoint associate professor at Newcastle Law School at the University of Newcastle. Moreover, he's editor in chief of Critical Criminology, an international journal. And with his multiple publications on environmental crime, um, he is a prime pioneer of cr green criminology, having co-edited, among others, the Rootledge International Handbook of Green Criminology in 2013. In 2015, he received a Critical Criminologist of the Year Award from the American Soci Society of Criminology Division on Critical Criminology. And much of his work has been translated into several languages, including Arabic, Chinese, and Persian. So without further ado, A.V., I will uh, leave you the floor and I will uh, let you know two minutes before the end uh, through private message that you have two minutes left. Okay, well, um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes? No? Um, well, first, it's very humbling to be here. Um, and uh, I, I think what I'll do with the time that I have uh, is speak a little bit more generally rather than uh, focus on uh, the specifics of, of work that I've done. Um, so I guess by, by way of beginning, I should just say a little bit about uh, my relationship between anthropology and crime. Um, so uh, my background is as a lawyer who then went and got a PhD in, uh, in, in anthropology. 
Uh, and as a doctoral student, I was interested in doing ethnographic work on uh, how young people conceived of crime and thought of crime. Uh, and my anthropology advisors uh, all thought that this was uh, a ridiculous thing to do, um, that what I should focus on was law. Uh, so they pushed me in the direction of the anthropology of law or legal anthropology, um, or they were interested in uh, political anthropology. Uh, they thought that if I wanted to study crime, uh, I should be a criminologist. Uh, and this struck me as uh, incredibly odd because the, the building in which the anthropology department was housed uh, was directly next to the sociology department, which is where people studied crime, and they were connected underground. Um, so one could literally walk from one to the other without uh, having to see the, the light of day, and they could not have been more separate from a disciplinary perspective. Um, they, the people in the buildings never spoke to each other, and I was probably the one person who had been in both of them. Um, so, so I found very little support for the study of, of crime as an anthropologist, um, wound up doing my doctoral work more oriented uh, towards law, um, but then found my professional home uh, in a department of, of criminology. Um, our school is called the School of Justice Studies, but that's a, uh, a kinder, softer way of saying that we uh, study uh, social harm and, and crime. Um, so I've actually not done very much on the anthropological side of things um, in the last uh, you know, 10 or 12 years or so. Um, and so it's a, a nice opportunity to go back and, and revisit some of these uh, uh, issues and questions. Um, so what I thought I would start off um, about is just saying something initially that when I did get to meet uh, criminologists, they were always fascinated by the fact that I could do ethnography and to do it without um, uh, any criticism because a lot of people who study crime in the United States um, are coming from a more quantitative oriented background. So they're very jealous of the opportunity uh, to do ethnography. Um, and so I, I think already uh, anthropologists interested in crime uh, have this opportunity to do a lot of the method that criminologists, at least in the States, don't get to do. And that's a very, I think, unique opportunity. Okay, so let me say a few things about um, what I think criminologists can learn from anthropologists. Um, and so about, uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, I wrote an article um, called Advancing Critical Criminology Through Anthropology. Um, and here I was just trying to, to kind of tease out um, some ideas about the ways in which uh, anthropology might be of interest to, to critical cr criminologists. And so I put forth uh, three propositions. Uh, one was that anthropology could help reveal processes of domination that are pervasive. Domination is a, a key area of interest for critical criminologists. Um, second, I, I contended that anthropology could remind us that what constitutes crime is culturally specific and temporal. Uh, and the third, that anthropology can help provide paradigms for better living, allowing critical criminologists to not be just critical, um, not just pre prescriptive, uh, but also aspirational. Um, these three propositions, I think, resonate a lot with uh, both the work um, uh, of Lucia and, and, and Henrik. Um, and so I thought I'd say a few words about those now. Um, so if we think of Lucia's article, The Cult of the Boss, um, I was fascinated by her comment and findings about the horizontal nature uh, of forms of authority. I think this idea could really help criminologists better appreciate how authority is co-produced uh, to commit crimes of the powerful. Crimes of the powerful is this sort of broad category uh, that criminologists use now uh, to approach uh, white collar crime, state crime, corporate crime, uh, state corporate crime. Um, but we often think in sort of hierarchical terms. And so this horizontal perspective, I think would be very uh, useful in that regard. Um, Along these lines, uh, the idea uh, of the Mafia Raj or the Ganda Raj, um, I think could enhance our understanding uh, of organize, organized crime categories, but also how power is understood, how it is maintained, and how it is used. In that same piece by Lucia, um, I think there's something useful for green criminologists, and that's really where I've spent most of my uh, time the last uh, 10 years. Um, those who study causes of environmental harm might be interested in understanding how the paradigmatic boss acquires and maintains power by 
achieving control over areas of ecological resources, not just economic resources. Um, and so I think that there's again an avenue there for uh, green criminologists who are interested in causes and consequences um, and ways of uh, addressing environmental harm. I think um, Heinrich's piece um, about anthropological uh, criminology um, has a lot, a lot of fruitful areas uh, for criminologists who are again looking for um, influences uh, and inspiration from anthropology rather than just from sociology. And so the five distinct propositions uh, that he put forth, um, I think are all relevant and all um, quite helpful. Um, obviously the ethnographic engagement, this idea of uh, embedded long-term field work, um, I think the idea of methodological mobility, so this idea of, of thinking of crime in sort of transnational or non-local uh, uh, ways uh, is helpful. Um, but I was most struck by the, the last three propositions. Um, this idea of uh, cross-cultural comparison. Uh, Henrik writes that anthropologists conduct studies in the global south, and that's really not an area in which uh, criminologists ha have engaged until relatively recently. Um, there's been some comparative, uh, there's been some transnational work. Um, I think what we're really seeing uh, uh, some interesting uh, endeavors has been in this idea of a Southern criminology or criminology of the global South. Um, and here you're seeing scholars from, uh, from Australia uh, in conversation and communication with those uh, in Brazil uh, and in Colombia. Um, and what we're discovering uh, through that research is that there's a been a lot of great critical criminological work uh, written in Spanish, written in Portuguese, uh, that in many respects predates the work that we often consider to be um, the, the founding uh, texts uh, of a critical criminology. Um, the idea that um, the state as a provider of justice is not as well accepted in non-Western uh, areas, again, I think is a really interesting idea for those critical criminologists um, with a more of an anarchist bent. Um, and so there's a, a sort of niche area in critical criminology called anarchist criminology. I think um, anyone interested in that should go back and look at Henrik's piece um, and to see whether or not one could pull some of those ideas about the role of the state um, as a, a purveyor of justice or a purveyor of injustice. Um, this idea of discovering um, or discoveries uh, of the ordinary, um, notion of boredom amongst police officers that Henrik talks about um, and whether or not some of the, um, the acts of violence that one sees, um, and he makes reference to Didier Fasson's um, work on uh, policing, um, makes one wonder whether or not it's boredom that leads to uh, violence rather, rather than uh, some other means or mechanism. I don't mean to suggest that that's why we're seeing uh, such um, horrific instances of police brutality in the United States. But I think that that's an, an interesting idea that could be added to the ways of understanding why it is that uh, police officers um, act as they, they have. That's not an idea that I've seen in, put forth in any criminological text. It comes purely from someone um, like Henrik working um, from a more anthropological bent. Um, so I think that could be uh, a, a part of the puzzle for any criminologists trying to really interrogate ideas of uh, police violence right now. Um, and then um, the idea of grounded critiques, um, making insights available for the public. Um, Henrik talks a little bit about um, the difference between a critical anthropology and an anthropology of critique. Um, I think that critical criminology could uh, intersect or intervene in this conversation, uh, especially with respect to the notion of a public criminology. One advantage the criminologists have in the United States for better or for worse is that they often have the ear um, of state leaders, um, of, of people who are in positions of power that may simply be because we often get money from them, um, from funding routines. Um, but criminologists often do have uh, better means or channels with those in positions of power than anthropologists do. So it could be a possibility um, for more sort of cross exchanges um, with respect to that public criminological side. Um, so with those ideas in mind, let me just say a little bit about what I'm doing now and then offer a couple, um, uh, a couple questions for us to consider. Um, the main project that I'm, I'm really working on is going back to field work that I had 
um, done a number of years ago on uh, what's called what I called youth legal consciousness. So the ways in which young people understand uh, the law, how they perceive it, imagine it to be, uh, what they think it um, it could be or should be. Uh, and so this had resulted in a book um, called Geometries of Crime. So basically, I took uh, the ethnographic work that I did, the dissertation um, or thesis, if you will, um, that was written from an anthropological perspective uh, and reformulated or recast it um, in criminological terms. Um, and so I dealt or played around with the idea of the square of crime, the prism of crime, um, crime triangles, um, and tried to create a sort of new geometry. Um, so basically using anthropological work um, and to present it in a uh, in a criminological way. What I'm trying to do now is to think of youth legal consciousness in relationship to uh, cultural criminology, which is very much interested uh, in criminological Verstehen. Um, this idea of how to, how to really appreciate and understand why individuals um, engage uh, in crime. Uh, the challenge that I think is, is, for me, is that the people that I worked with were all younger than I was, um, considerably younger, um, 15, 16, 13, 14. Um, so to try to approach something from a, a perspective of Verstehen is a little bit harder when there's such a, a tremendous um, age difference. And so I wonder whether or not the concept of youth legal consciousness can be integrated with this idea uh, of Verstehen. That I'm trying to, um, uh, to mix oil and vinegar here, uh, it may be that, uh, or oil and water, I should say. Well, I'm going to go actually go very well together. Um, uh, so it may be that I'm, tr I'm trying to bring together uh, two areas that, that don't really work, but I think that's the challenge for me now is to see whether or not uh, components of legal anthropology um, could draw on or could be integrated with, uh, with cultural anthropology, uh, cultural criminology. Um, so that's the, the book project that's uh, uh, going forward now. Uh, and now for the questions. Um, so for me, it's very easy to think of how anthropologists um, can offer useful uh, insights, perspectives, uh, approaches for criminologists. So I think there's a lot that criminologists can learn. Um, the question I think is, uh, is then whether or not anthropologists are willing to learn from, uh, from criminologists. Uh, my personal experience was that uh, anthropologists, at least those in the States were very insular. Uh, they didn't really want to have any connections with criminologists. They sort of saw criminology as the kind of bastard uh, stepchild of sociology, which they already didn't like. Um, so I think that there's some disciplinary conflict there. But if they are willing to learn, and I get the sense that that may be more accepted um, in this international um, realm, um, great. I think what we should think about then is how we see uh, anthropological criminology um, or the anthropology of crime in relationship to legal anthropology or political anthropology. Um, there are references to that from uh, the previous speakers. Um, again, I may be coming from um, a place in which everyone likes to set up their little theoretical camp um, and stay uh, divided. Um, but I would be curious to see how the people who are here and listening and speaking um, conceive of this relationship with the anthropology of crime or anthropological uh, criminology to some of the other established ones. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you so much, Evie. You did have some uh, more time, but um, well, thank you so much for this illuminating and inspiring speech uh, where you really also nicely tied up the work mentioned in this launching event and um, inviting us to think and rethink how these two, uh, well, feuding disciplines, maybe at times of anthropology and criminology and especially the multifaceted field of critical criminology can and should be intertwined. And um, so on this note, I think uh, I will give you, Martin, the words uh, so we can open the floor for, for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Lina. And uh, um, let me see.